goodness. Well, thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please take a seat. My goodness. What a uh, what a great welcome and uh, what a what a great state you guys have. This is my first time in South Dakota and it's a it's just a beautiful state and uh, you guys have made me feel right at home. You know I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee where uh, we eat our our chicken fried and our biscuits uh, buttered and our tea sweet and and brother Phil showed up at the airport with a glass of sweet tea to welcome me to Rapid City. So I'm a happy camper. You know, before we get started, though, um, I, I want to clear the air, and I just want to give you fair warning. Uh, just out of curiosity, though, do we um, do we have any Fox News fans in the in the room uh, tonight? Okay. This is this is good to know. I mean, if there are MSNBC uh, viewers here, uh, we have assembled a, a, a group of deacons and elders, and they would love to have a moment of intercessory prayer with you. Um, afterwards so but I, I warn you because it's about to get a little politically incorrect up in here um, and I hope you guys don't mind that you know I'm one of those people that uh, former President Obama called bitter uh, clinging to my guns and my religion I'm uh, one of those people that Hillary Clinton called deplorable irredeemable and uh, I want you to know something before we go any further I am proud to call myself a gun-toting, Bible-clinging son of a Baptist. I'm not bitter, I'm blessed, and I'm not irredeemable because I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, I, um, I'm excited about what God is about to do uh, through Family Heritage Alliance and the, the new leadership uh, that has been installed. And uh, Norman's speech was, was pretty epic. And uh, I'm excited for what's going to be happening in this state. And I'm especially excited because you guys get it. You understand that if we are going to take back America, if we are going to reclaim what our founding fathers envisioned for this country, it's not going to start at the White House. It has to start at your house. And, and that's, that's what you guys are doing. These culture impact teams, everywhere I go across this country, I'm, I'm imploring people to get involved and start these culture impact teams because they can and they will make a difference. It is the key. Now, um, I always forget to do this, but uh, I want to uh, reference my, my website, toddstarns.com. This is sort of the portal to everything we do at, at Fox News. And if you'd like to get a, a signed copy of any of my books, you can do it there uh, at that place. And also, uh, you can sign up for our free newsletter. So we don't charge you any money or anything of that nature. Well, you got to buy the book, but, uh, you know, we're not socialist. But, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but we do give away the, uh, the newsletter. That's, that's, that's free. Uh, so, so I would encourage you to do that because we provide you news and information that you're not going to get in, in the mainstream media. You know, we were talking earlier today, and people asked me, well, Todd, tell us about where you live. Well, I was born and raised in, in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm a son of the South, but I've been living in Brooklyn, New York for the past 15 years, and I live among the indigenous liberal population of the city. And people ask me, Todd, why would you subject yourself to such hostility? Why would you do that? And I felt that to truly understand the American liberal, I needed to live in their natural habitat. So it's sort of like being pastor on, on a mission field, if you will. Uh, my neighborhood is populated with vegetarian and yoga shops and farm-to-table restaurants that only serve organic eggs harvested by Amish midwives. I mean, it really is that <laughs> organic of a neighborhood. It's delicious eggs, but you know. Now, my neighborhood is also populated with hipsters. I don't know if you guys have hipsters in South Dakota, but we've got a mess of them back in New York City. And you can normally tell uh, the hipsters because they're wearing you know, knit caps in the summertime and they're wearing the skinny jeans. And when I moved to my neighborhood, um, let's just say I sort of stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, you see me walking down the street 
And you think one of two things. The guy's either a Republican or a Baptist. And so we, um, we have a wardrobe department at Fox News. They make us look, uh, look beautiful and, and, and HD. And, and I went to go see the ladies there in the wardrobe department. And they said, well, Todd, if you really want to fit in, you need to go buy some skinny jeans. <laughs> so I went down to the skinny jean store. And um, it's an interesting thing about skinny jeans. You really do need to be skinny if you're going to wear them. <laughs> It took a shoehorn and a tub of butter to get my big toe in those things. Uh, that wasn't a good look for me, not at all. Now, we, we, were, we were talking earlier about the National Rifle Association. I happen to be a member of the National Rifle Association. I know as a, the, I know as a journalist, they say the pen is mightier than a, the sword, but a Glock is a lot more effective uh, when, when push comes to shove. Just saying, just saying. Well, my mailman tells me I'm the only member of the NRA in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. And, and I, 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 I believe that because if you're a member of the NRA, you know you get about a pound of mail a month from those good people. Um, but one of the other cool things you get is a ball cap. And it's a black ball cap with the gold letters NRA. And I want to share a story with you about something that happened to me in my neighborhood. This was right about the time Hurricane Sandy was bearing down on the city. Do you remember that? Uh, and of course, New Yorkers, they're not used to hurricanes, but being from the Deep South, I, I'm pretty familiar with it. And basically, I mean, they were, they were just like hoarding everything in the store. And of course, being a vegetarian neighborhood, I mean, less like the produce section was laid waste. I mean, there, you couldn't get a kumquat to save your life. So, but in my estimation, the only thing you really need to survive a hurricane is a, um, well, uh, you, you need a six-pack of Abita Springs root beer, uh, which is a delicious root beer from Louisiana. You need, a, um, you need some duct tape, and you need a, a, a pork butt uh, so you can smoke the pork butt uh, and have something to eat while the winds blow. So anyway, I'm walking down to my neighborhood to get my provisions to survive the hurricane, and I put on my ball cap, and I wasn't even thinking because, uh, Pastor Scott, you know, you don't want to intentionally antagonize the liberals, you know, but so normally I'll wear my John Deere tractor hat, but um, I grab that NRA ball cap. I don't know what it's like in your neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, all of the liberal advocacy groups, they like, they, they wait outside the, um, the, the supermarket, and they want to ask people for money. It's sort of like in, remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? You know, it's sort of like the Pumas waiting to, like, pounce on the gazelles. You know, they want your money. So you got the, you got the Planned Parenthood and Human Rights Commission and all of these groups, Greenpeace, and the PETA people are the worst. They're just so aggressive. So anyway, it was interesting because when I rounded the corner, Wearing that NRA ball cap, it was like Moses parting the Red Sea. They didn't want to have a thing to do with me. <laughs> Except for this PETA woman. And she, so I'm coming out of the market. You just have to imagine the picture. I got my pork butt under my armpit like this. I got my, you know, I'm trying to mind my own business here. And I'm walking out and the woman stops me. And she's got this bony meatless uh, finger there. And she's like shaking it at me. And she says, sir, do you love animals? And I looked at that lady, I said, only if they're deep fried, and kept right on walking. So that's, that's my story. You know, in the, um, in the book of Daniel, we find an interesting story. And uh, I grew up uh, going to um, a Baptist church. My grandparents were Methodist, and so I sort of, during the summertime in vacation Bible school, I got it from both ends. And we, um, we learned a story about three fellows named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were faced with a very interesting dilemma. Do you obey God or do you obey the government? You know, I believe that faith and freedom go hand in hand. It's been that way from the early days of our great nation. But for many years, under the previous administration, Americans were told that we were the problem, that we were not a Christian nation, that we were not an exceptional nation. Our traditions and our values have been ridiculed and marginalized. We've been mocked by Hollywood and dismissed by the academics, bullied and belittled by the sects 
and gender revolutionaries. But I believe all that changed on election day when a man who promised to defend religious liberty, a man who promised to make America great again, was elected. Now, I have to admit to you that Donald Trump was not my first or second or third or no, you know, 16th choice in the Republican <laughs> primaries. But you know what? On election day, by golly, he was the only choice. When I wrote The Deplorable's Guide to Making America Great Again, and let me, let me back up for just a moment. I was writing that book, and I wasn't quite sure. We didn't know what the outcome of the election was going to be. So my publisher mandated that I have a second book title ready to go in the event of the, you know, I can't even speak the words. Um, <laughs> so we were going to call that one, We're Doomed America, Your Guide to a Happy Apocalypse. But we didn't have to do that. But I got to tell you, when I wrote that book, there was no guarantee that, that Donald Trump was going to follow through on all these campaign promises. But so far, so good. I mean, he nominated Neil Gorsuch to the court, now Judge Kavanaugh. Even more importantly, he's nominated countless numbers of strict constitutionalists to the lower courts. And I just want to ask this question for all of those never-Trumpers, especially never-Trumpers who are also fellow believers. Could you imagine what a Hillary Clinton Supreme Court would look like and what it would do to this country? Was that the better option? Was that the moral high ground? I think not. But Donald Trump, he came to us. He's not a preacher, not a Sunday school teacher. He'd make a pretty good deacon maybe. I don't know. It. <laughs> Some of you preachers know what I, you got that one. But you know what? This man came to us. He came to our leaders. And he said, if you elect me, if you trust me with your vote, I'm going to look after your people. And so far, he's living up to that promise. I mean, he's the most pro-life president in modern history. He's done more to protect religious liberty than any other president in modern history. And I just pray that one day Congress will muster the courage to once and for all defund Planned Parenthood abortion mills. Not a single taxpayer dollar, not a one. But we need to pray for our president. Just a few months ago, Franklin Graham told me on my radio program, he told me flat out there are people within the government who want to take down the presidency. They want to destroy Donald Trump. And why is it? A lot of people have asked me this question. Why is it they're so hard on Donald Trump? It's really not so much Donald Trump. It's all you folks. You see, they hate the fact that they really are the minority in America. That the silent majority finally rose up and said, you know what? Enough is enough. Just remember, the Obama administration they weaponized the federal government. I mean, there really is such a thing as the deep state. They weaponized the IRS to go after religious organizations and pro-life groups. They even audited the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. This is the work of the deep state. And so, look, I warn people about this in my book, that we cannot afford to be complacent. Yes, Donald Trump is in the White House. But we still have a lot of work to do. You know, my book is based on a sermon delivered by Adrian Rogers, a pastor that I have admired for many years. He passed away several years ago. But in the 1990s, he wrote a book about Christian, or he wrote a sermon about Christian citizenship. And I asked the folks at Love Worth Finding if I could use that sermon as really the, the thesis for this book, what does it mean to be a Christian citizen in America? But the culture war rages on, brothers and sisters, and we must stand and fight. I want to tell you about a couple of stories that have just crossed my, uh, my desk in recent days. We had Coach Joe Kennedy on my program. Coach Joe, a football coach, a Marine veteran, he saw a movie called Facing the Giants. 
And he was inspired by that movie to take a knee after every football game to pray and thank God, no matter the outcome. Well, the local school district in Bremerton, Washington, told Coach Joe, Coach, you can't do that anymore. You can't walk out onto the field after the game and take a knee to pray. And they said, Coach, you're not allowed to even stand on the sidelines and bow your head and pray. Coach, you're not allowed to do anything that would give the students or people in the stands any impression that you were doing anything religious. Well, the Friday night football came in Bremerton, Washington, and you know what happened. After that football game, Coach Joe, the Marine veteran, the Christian, he walked out onto that football field, and he took a knee, and he was fired. Coach Joe is now being represented by our friends at First Liberty Institute. And so far, they've lost every court battle. And now, Coach Joe's fate rests in the hands of the Supreme Court. I find it ironic that you can take a knee on a football field to protest America, but you can be fired for taking a knee to pray to God. This is the country we live in, brothers and sisters. Just a few days ago, I received word that a federal judge appointed to the bench by Ronald Reagan, of all people, just ordered that a cross be removed from a park in downtown Pensacola. That cross had been there for generations, but now that cross has to come down. Just yesterday, I told a story about what happened in Bossier City, Louisiana. There's a football field there and the Booster Club to raise money. They invite local businesses to buy ads. So there's a guy there by the name of Billy Weatherall. Billy's a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. He's a big old guy. He could bench press, he could bench press table three right here. He could bench press all of you guys. Strong guy. And the name of his gym is called Christ Fit Gym. And they don't charge any money to come in and work out. It's just a do donation process. They love Jesus in that gym. So he took out an ad. And so as a result of that, they spray painted his logo in the end zones. The name of the gym, Christ Fit Gym. A beautiful Bible passage along with the logo of the gym, which happens to be a cross. Last Friday... They called the owner of that gym and said, we have to spray paint over your ad. It's against the law. Well, before the owner could do anything, they had called two students out of class. And they told these kids, these two teenage boys, their job was to go and take cans of spray paint, and they were to spray paint over the name of Jesus. Let that sink in for just a minute. The school officials told those children to go and spray paint over the name of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you what happened. One of those boys wrote about what happened on his Facebook page, and I want to share it with you this evening. This just happened. Those young men looked up to their school leaders and said, we're not going to do that. They said, and this is the quote, you have to stand up for Christ no matter what. And we just told the coaches we wouldn't do it. We ended up leaving the field and not helping them cover up the scripture that was put on that field. And this is something striking. And it really, it echoes what Norman just shared with us. This young man, this teenage boy said this, no matter what people say, you have to stand up for Christ, even if it could get you in trouble with the school. That's a teenage boy, a Christian young man. Imagine the, the courage in that, in that young man, to stand up to authority like that. But I've got to tell you, the fight goes on. Guess what happened? Just before dinner tonight, I received a text message from Billy Weatherall, the guy who could bench press table three. And do you know what he said? He said, Todd, after your story came out, I wrote a column about it. After your story came out, the school board held an emergency meeting. And he said, Todd, they voted unanimously to put my ad back on the football field. So how about that? Man, I got so excited, I almost did a Pilates. So I don't even know what that is, but I almost did it. 
Sorry for the visual there. We just had dinner. My apologies. I'm sorry. But you say, well, this is kind of exciting. So, I mean, we're seeing these victories here, but what's really going on around the country? Why do we need these culture impact teams in places like South Dakota where just about everybody goes to church? Well, I want to tell you why. Because the progressives and the militant LGBT activists are waging a war on the Christian faith. And they are attacking religious liberty laws across the country. Now, it happened in the state of Georgia, of all places. I mean, everybody is a Baptist in the state of Georgia. Even the Catholics are Baptist in Georgia. <laughs> and the governor, who is a Republican, vetoed the religious liberty bill because big business put the squeeze on the Republicans. You say, well, what's going on here? Well, I was, I, I'm, I'm doing research for my new book, and I found a Rolling Stone article, and it explained what was happening. There's a guy in Colorado. His name is Tim Gill. He is a multi-millionaire who earned his money in the tech industry. And he is bankrolling these fights against religious liberty in every single state in America. I want you to listen to this chilling quote from Mr. Gill. It's in Rolling Stone. You can Google it. Not now, but you can Google it later. Mr. Gill said he wants to take down people who hold traditional views about sexual morality. And here's the quote. He said, quote, I want to punish the wicked. That's what this man thinks about all of you in this room tonight. So as you can see, the fight rages on. And that's why we must have these local culture impact teams engaged in the politics and in the culture. Norman said it. President Reagan said, freedom just one generation away from extinction. I believe in 2016, we came mighty close. Now, Franklin Graham told me we were at a moral tipping point. But I'm not, look, this is the view from the pew here. I'm not a pastor or a theologian, but I think God gave us a second chance to get this right. And I believe the reason why... And I believe the reason why is because of the men and women here in this room. Men and women who are unafraid to stand resolute in the face of a hostile culture. Let's go back to the Old Testament, the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, sometimes, sometimes these stories don't have a happy ending. You know, sometimes there's a price to pay for standing up for your beliefs. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were what? Thrown into a fiery furnace. They were bound up. And they were thrown in there. They had no idea what, what, the, what the outcome was going to be. They were prepared to sacrifice their lives for what they believed. But we also know what happened, right? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not in that fiery furnace alone, were they? No. The Almighty was there. What a great reminder for all of us. What a great reminder for people like Baronel Stutzman and Jack Phillips. They're going through their own modern-day fiery furnaces, but they're not alone. They're not alone. You know, it's interesting about that story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They say not a hair on their head was singed, not a thread on their clothing was burned. But you know, something was destroyed in the flames. Those ropes that bound their hands and their feet, they burned away. See, I have hope in America, brothers and sisters. I do believe that we, the people, can fundamentally restore what President Obama transformed. And I believe that together we can forge a new path. I have hope in America because of people like Joe Kennedy and the people of Brandon, Mississippi. A federal judge came to the local high school and said, you can't do anything religious. If you do, we're going to slap you with a $10,000 fine. The high school principal started, started researching and investigating. He found out the marching band was doing a halftime performance of How Great Thou Art. He started doing the math. He realized they didn't have enough money and petty cash to cover the trombone section. So he called, the, he called the band kids in and said, students, I'm sorry, but the federal government says it's against the law for you to play How Great Thou Art. We're going to have to cancel your halftime show. Well, that Friday night football game came there in Brandon, Mississippi, near Jackson. Hot and humid, mosquitoes all over the place. The stands packed with people. 
the football teams, they trot off the field at halftime and an eerie silence filled the stadium. No one knew what to do. And suddenly, a little teenage cheerleader, she put down her pom-poms and she stood up and she started singing these words, Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder. And soon, one by one, people in the stands began standing to their feet. School teachers and housewives and police officers and construction workers. And soon, a mighty voice rose up in that stadium in defiance of their government, saying, Oh, Lord, my God, how great thou art. You see, the people of Brandon, Mississippi, they took a stand. And you see, I have hope in America because of that. I have hope in America because of a young man named, named Roy Costner from Liberty, South Carolina. I love telling Roy's story, a valedictorian of his graduating class. He wrote a beautiful speech. Roy talked about the Lord and how his church community had carried him through some difficult times. Roy had to turn that speech in to his principal. Five teachers censored Roy's speech. He showed me what the speech looked like. They had used a thick black magic marker to blot out every Bible verse and every reference to God and church looked like an NSA document. <laughs> Roy didn't know what to do. So you know where he went for help and for guidance? He went to the church house. He talked to his preacher and they sat together and prayed Graduation day came in Liberty, South Carolina. It was a big crowd there. All those teachers who censored Roy's speech were in the front row, his mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. They wouldn't even let Roy carry a piece of paper up onto the stage. You see, those uh, educators didn't want Roy to pull a fast one. But those educators did not count on the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, Roy Costner, when he walked up to that stage, the government-approved speech was laid right here on the platform. And he took that speech high in his hands, and then he did this. He tore it in half, and in an act of civil disobedience, this young man said to the audience gathered, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see, Roy Costner, an 18-year-old from Liberty, South Carolina, and he took a stand. And I want to ask all of you here in this room tonight, who among us is willing to stand with the Coach Joes of the world? Who among us is willing to stand with the Baronel Stutzmans of the world? Who among us is willing to stand with the Roy Costners of the world? Yeah, they may try to silence our voices. They may try to bully us into submission. But we must not be silent, and we must not be bullied. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we must not bow down. There is a quote that is often attributed to the great German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You probably know it. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Well, I believe this is a Bonhoeffer moment for every Bible-believing Christian in America. God's little lambs can no longer be silent. We are to be civil lambs, but not silent lambs. And like my friends, the Benham brothers once said, we've got to roar like the lions. The time has come for all of us to stand together. In closing, there's a scene in a wonderful film. I'm a movie buff. I love movies, especially war movies. One of my favorite, We Were Soldiers, tells the story of the Battle of the Lodring Valley. You've probably seen that movie. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore and his Army Rangers were surrounded. The enemy was advancing, and all appeared to be hopeless. Joe Galloway was there, a reporter with United Press International. He was caught up in the melee. When the bullets started flying, the reporter dropped to the ground. 
And in the middle of all of this chaos and all of this carnage, there was one person who stood resolute, a man by the name of Sergeant Major Basil Plumley. And he walked over, and he saw the trembling journalist, and he kicked him with his boot. And he told the terrified journalist, you can't take no pictures from down there, Sonny. <laughs> and then that old crusty Sergeant Major, he tossed the reporter a rifle. But the reporter, he rejected the weapon. I'm a non-combatant. That's what he said. I'm a non-combatant. And that old Sergeant Major looked down at that young man, that American, and said, son, there ain't no such thing today. Well, as the story goes, that reporter, he picked up that weapon. He dusted himself up, got up out of the dirt, stood alongside his fellow countrymen, and as we know, facing unimaginable odds, the Americans won the day. So I say this in closing. My fellow Americans, we are surrounded. The cultural bullets are flying. The enemies of freedom are advancing, and the time has, all of, has come for all of us to stand resolute. You say, but Todd, I'm not a fighter. Well, there's no such thing today, because we are freedom's last line of defense. So I say this, do not hide liberty's light under a bushel. No, hold it high. Let the flame of freedom burn bright for the world to see. I believe it's time for every gun-toting, Bible-clinging, deplorable American to take a thunderous stand for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And let our prayer be on this day that our great nation will once again be that shining city on a hill. God bless you all, and thank you very much.